So we'll just give it a half a minute and then start actually. So Dr. Thamza, I'm going to go ahead and start. So welcome everyone to the third lecture for the DAPA Grand Rounds. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Thompson as our speaker. Uh, he's a world-renowned pathologist that doesn't need any introduction, but just to, to give you a brief introduction, he's a part of the editorial board of, of the WHO Blue Books. Uh, he has been like providing his input for all the different Blue Books uh, and but is uh, uh, the main lead for the WHO Head and Neck Blue Book. Uh, besides the WHO Blue Books, he's also an author author of uh, the Head and Neck uh, Pathology in the Foundation in Diagnostic Pathology series, as well as the Emeritus series, which are very well known books in the in, in, in pathology. He has uh, also worked at the AFIP for ten years and uh, currently works out of California where he runs a consultation practice and gets uh, consultations from all around the world. And it would be great to learn from his experience today about head and neck cases. So the floor is all yours, Dr. Thompson, and we look forward to a great spectacular learning session from you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Singh. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and to present a few unknown cases within the context of the new World Health Organization classification. Um, as you know, uh, we always have to put out our various disclosures and as a standing member of the editorial board, as well as an expert member for the ENT book, I feel, you know, I should at least include that. So as you know, the uh, WHO book uh, has been part of the fifth series. It has been a bit slow for all of the various books to come out. But actually, the Head and Neck book is online now and is available for people to see, although only virtually not yet in print. So, you know, I always like to put things in context. Uh, this is the group from 2003. And I think you will notice uh, in this particular instance, um, I am over here in the far corner. You can see me standing there. But nothing changes in the 13 years. I'm still standing in the exact same position. And yet here we are now inside in 2016. But alas, for the current version, we all had to be on Zoom in order to be able to do the meeting. However, I think the things that are the most fabulous about this new edition is the fact that they are all hosted interactively, which means you do not have to have a physical copy any longer. Virtual slides have now been hosted for it. Um, all of the references link out into PubMed ID so that you can look at it automatically online. And of course, there's been a consolidation of essential and desirable diagnostic characteristics. So with that in mind, let's kind of start off with a case. 69-year-old presented with an eyelid swelling for two years, had hypoglobus and a 3.7 centimeter mass was noted. And I think you can see that here is the mass actually extending down the nasolacrimal uh, duct area. So let's drive this particular case. I think here you will notice um, what I usually try and do when I look at cases is first go to the uh, epithelial side of it, because of course everything in the upper air digestive tract should have epithelium somewhere. And I think you will notice this is unremarkable and not really involved at all. And then you go into what is a very heavily sclerotic and hyalinized background material. Um, but in fact, if you look at it a little bit closer, you can see that there are in fact areas of a spindle cell population if you go up onto much higher power, you'll see that it's uh, remarkably bland, but still well-developed spindle cell population. And so as you look at that, you kind of say, well, you know, what type of lesion or what type of uh, process am I dealing with? Is this actually neoplastic? Is it reactive? Is it part of something like a nodular fasciitis? Is it actually a neoplasm? If it's a neoplasm, do you put it into the benign or malignant? And what is it that you can do to try and resolve that particular issue? Well, you know, when I think about this, um, there are a lot of tumors that come to mind. Here are just a few of them, and I'm going to try and go over just a few in this particular session, but realize they're quite a large number that are included in it with a very broad immunohistochemical panel that is incorporated into it. And with that in mind, just remember that you may in fact have any of these particular markers be positive, and you can see that there's quite a remarkable overlap when you do look at it. And so that's something uh, significant to remember in a panel approach with these particular lesions. So another way of looking at it is kind of an algorithmic approach where you start off with sort of a pan-cytokeratin because everything in the upper air digestive tract, if there's one thing that you must not miss, it's the most common tumor, which is of course always a squamous cell carcinoma. And so with that in mind, 
just remember spindle cell uh, or sarcomatoid squamous cell carcinoma can certainly develop uh, relatively common, a little bit more so in the larynx, oral cavity, and then sinonasal tract. And of course, prognosis is determined by size and epithelial expression. So when I look at these tumors, they're often polypoid, as you can see from here with variable uh, cellularity. Uh, when you go up to high power, I always try to fi find areas of transition from the surface epithelium going down into the underlying uh, compartment of the stroma and see how those things react. I think all of them here, all of this area, you can see that it is actually a transition from the surface epithelium that is clearly dysplastic. No one would have any problem uh, seeing that this is a squamous cell carcinoma in situ that has transitioned into the underlying stromal compartment. In other areas like this, you may have isolated areas of nuclear pleomorphism, certainly having atypical mitotic figures easily identified in spaces like this. However, in an area like this, where it is much more hypocellular and just having isolated areas of nuclear hyperchromasia, getting a diagnosis of spindle squamous cell carcinoma in a field like this would be quite challenging. As you know, most of these tumors are AE1, AE3 or pan cytokeratin uh, positive. Actually, Oscar is probably an excellent marker to do in this particular setting, but recognize also that things like P63, P40, and CK56 will often highlight the neoplastic population in the stroma in order to confirm that it is in fact just a sarcomatoid transformation. There are several reporting guidelines. The new one from the ICCR is one that is uh, free of charge so that you can just go to their website and be able to download it without any problem. The reason I include this is, of course, you know, the new TFCP uh, carcinoma group, uh, oh, I'm sorry, rhabdomyosarcoma group is incorporated into this particular spindle cell differential and is a relatively new category. So the TFCP2 rhabdo is something that develops in the he head and neck almost um, exclusively or at least specifically around the mandible and maxilla, sometimes from the um, skull bones as well. And it is a biphasic spindle cell and epithelioid tumor. Um, sometimes they're more epithelioid, sometimes they're more round cell, but in general, a spindled component is present. And you will notice from the immunophenotypic uh, expression that AE1 is going to be positive in these tumors. So if you're only doing a single immunohistochemistry, you will often miss this particular diagnosis. So let me just highlight some of the other uh, findings in this tumor as well, where you can see that the surface looks like, mm, you know, maybe it's a little bit separated, but could that not be that there is a transition? And so if you look at this area, you may think, oh, it's coming off the surface. Now, in my view, the surface here is not dysplastic and therefore would be a little bit less likely to have a spindle cell arising from a non-dysplastic epithelium, although it can happen. But still, as I look at this population, when you go on higher power, it's very easy to see that it is an epithelioid quality to it with slightly eosinophilic cytoplasm, although many of the cells are also spindled in their morphology. So as I look at a AE1, AE3, as you can see in this example, I think you will really notice immediately that in this instance, if that is the only marker you did, you would potentially just call it a spindle squamous cell carcinoma. Whereas if you added in things like Desmond or myogenin or myoD1, and alternatively with ALK, you will see that they now co-express these particular findings. So again, it is imperative that a panel approach be utilized in the diagnosis of lesions in the upper area digestive tract. Now, of course, mucosal melanoma is also something that needs to be considered in the spindle cell differential. As you know, if it is uh, involving the junction, you kind of have a confirmation of at least a primary site, although not always as you can have pagetoid spread from a tumor arising in the stroma alone. So as we all know, the uh, melanoma has a very broad histologic spectrum and we use the term protean, just means that it has the ability to present in any different fashion. Uh, got, uh, uh, Proteus is the Greek god of change. So you can have a lot of different patterns of growth. And so here is an example of a, a in situ component in metaplastic squamous epithelium, where you can see a remarkably pleomorphic melanoma cell present at the junction, matching those that are in the stroma below. However, if you just had a spindle cell population like this, with remarkable variation in size and shape, prominence to the nucleoli, not really any uh, cytoplasmic pigmentation to speak of, it can be a much more challenging diagnosis. And so in that particular setting, we do try to do as many of the panel approach to this in order to be able to allow uh, for a separation between the lesions. So just recognize that they should not be pan cytokeratin, Desmond, or SMA positive, and that may be a little bit more helpful as well. And again, recognize that there are differences in the mutation status from uh, cutaneous melanomas that are much more frequently associated with BRAF, whereas mucosal lesions tend to be NRAS or KIT associated.
So here is an example of a SOX10, very strong nuclear reaction in a spindle cell population. Of course, it's not specific for melanoma. SOX10, as you know, highlights many other lesions as well. And here is an example of both nuclear and cytoplasmic reactivity with S100, an example of HMB45, another one with melan A, just to show that each of these various markers can have remarkable variation in their quality and consistency of staining. And of course, everyone likes to use PRAME now, although again, this is not something that is specific for melanoma only, even though that would be suggested by the name uh, with melanoma in it. However, there are several other tumors that can be positive. However, still in a very focused approach, um, if you're having trouble reaching the diagnosis, then this could certainly be of value. And again, the ICCR has put out a very nice um, reporting guideline for mucosal melanomas of the head and neck that are freely available from the ICCR website. So the diagnosis for the case that I drove is a solitary fibrous tumor. It happens to be the myxoid type and solitary fibrous tumors definitely develop in the upper air digestive tract around the orbit, especially although the sinonasal tract, even salivary gland, and I've seen them in the thyroid as well. So they really can develop anywhere within that anatomic uh, group. I think that the um, kind of pseudo encapsulated area with these bland spindle shaped cells is probably the tip off to the diagnosis. Um, stellate and staghorn vessels with that collagenized uh, background. Now, as we know, STAT6 is quite helpful in the diagnosis, but I will just highlight that STAT6 can be also positive in other tumors like the GLEE1-associated lesions. So just be aware that it isn't always um, specific in this particular case. So a large polypoid lesion in the sinonasal tract, um, it tends to project out into the lumen. And because of that, the surface will be denuded and therefore, immediately under the surface, you are likely to have an increased number of mitotic figures. As you know, solitary fibrous tumor is in fact stratified by um, mitotic figures as one of the parameters for the index. And therefore, it is important to recognize um, that you do not count them in a space like this because you will overestimate the malignant potential of the lesion. I think that this is probably the sine qua non that we all look for with a very bland appearance to the spindle cells set in a richly collagenized stroma. Sometimes the cellularity is much higher as you can see in this particular field of a different case immediately below an area with a, a staghorn like vessel. Um, what is interesting is that the collagen tends to be quite refractile. So I know you cannot do this on a digital slide, but if you drop the substage condenser, you'll actually have a refractility to it. But um, still, I think everyone can recognize this very rich collagen background. Um, CD34 and BCL2 used to be used uh, to highlight this particular tumor. However, as I said now, with a STAT6 with this particular morphology, the diagnosis of a solitary fibrous tumor would certainly be easily um, reached. So using an immunohistochemical panel approach, again, you can see that the STAT6 is the only marker that is going to be reactive in this particular tumor with the rest of the ones in the panel negative, uh, helping you to reach that particular interpretation. Of course, one also has to think about biphenotypic sinonasal uh, sarcoma. This is a tumor that actually was included in the previous edition of the WHO, uh, specifically related by a recurrent um, PAX3 mammal 3 gene fusion, although other fusions are identified as well. So it is not um, only with that particular um, fusion. Usually multiple sites within the sinonasal tract and obviously a destructive type lesion. So here you can see the surface epithelium being pulled down into the lesion that is otherwise a monotonous spindle cell population, a kind of a fascicular architectural arrangement in an intersecting fashion. And I think what's unique about each of these particular cells is you'll notice they have a remarkable monotony. So whenever I see a very monotonous population, a fusion-driven tumor is one that comes to mind. So with solitary fibrous tumor, which was the diagnosis here, it looked quite bland as well. And all of the cells tended to be um, isomorphic one to another. And that's because of the NAB2 STAT6 fusion. Here it is a different fusion, but again, a fusion-related tumor. Now, all of this epithelium is actually non-neoplastic. It is just being pulled in from the surface. Sometimes you'll see it with a area of squamous metaplasia or something that even looks similar to a sinonasal papilloma. Other areas may have areas of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, as you can see in this example here, the spindle cell population on that side, but rhabdomyoblastic differentiation here, where it actually matches with a different um, fusion partner, usually with either FOX01 or NCOA A1, rather than with the mammal 3. So just be aware that you can have different fusion partners. Now, the most important thing to remember about the smooth muscle actin or muscle-specific actin and S100 protein, hence the biphenotypic name. This is where the biphenotypic arises. It is because of this co-expression of both uh, muscle and neurogenic markers. It is not related to the fact 
that the surface epithelium has been pulled in. I know a lot of people think that's the case, but it is not. So it can be very patchy focal or um, variable staining. And that's the thing that's very important, especially when you're looking at these lesions on core needle biopsies. So here is an example of a strong S100, um, not so fantastic S100 here, whereas here is an example of a very delicate smooth muscle actin reactivity in the stromal neoplastic cells versus a much stronger reaction here. So just be aware that you can have remarkable variation in that. Of course, the tumor does express nuclear beta-catenin. This is not, as you can tell, related to a CT-NNB1 fusion, but instead is just a reaction with nuclear beta-catenin. SOX10 is not reactive, so actually this is where you're doing your panel. You can tell that there is going to be differential expression. Here is a normal minor mucoserous gland reacting so that you can tell the tumor cells are not positive. If you have done, Desmond, as you should in the panel, you'll see that it would have highlighted the areas of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, which truly are rhabdomyoblastic. So they will be myogen and myoD1 positive as well, just as an example um, on the right-hand side. It's also important with the spindle cell differential to think of meningiomas. These arise from within the skull base and then expand down through the nooks and crannies or foramina coming down into the sinonasal tract. Um, and they often just blend with the surrounding epithelium. Of course, there will be bone destruction, right? Because it's going through the skull base in order to be able to get there. So sometimes you will see this kind of bony destruction lesion of something that is otherwise considered to be um, benign for the most part, because they're almost always a who type, uh, who grade one type lesion. So here on higher power, I think you can see the blending between the areas of the meningothelial differentiated cells versus those that are ductal um, and minor mucoserous glands um, in the deep stroma. And then an area like this with gorgeous intranuclear inclusions and even a somoma body present over here, I think that the diagnosis is much easier. I would also like to just mention the EBV associated smooth muscle tumor. This is a new lesion incorporated into this edition of the WHO as well. And this is a tumor that is specifically associated with immunosuppression, most frequently related to, liver tra uh, to kidney transplantation, but certainly can be seen in a variety of other immunocompromised states. And there's quite a remarkable variation in the spindle cell quality, where some are a bit more epithelioid to box shaped, and it can be remarkably cellular with increased mitotic activity, although necrosis tends not to be seen except in those with um, HIV association. As you will notice with the immunohistochemistry, the smooth muscle differentiation is obvious, but the EBV ISH is what is required for the tumor. So it is separate from the overlying surface epithelium. You can see that it is remarkably cellular, has lots of mitotic figures in this particular case, kind of an epithelioid quality to these cells as you look at them rather than necessarily being spindled, although there is a variation from field to field. And then of course, Desmond will be reactive as will a nuclear reaction with Eber. So it is something that you really need to consider. And if you do not do an Eber for smooth muscle related tumors, you will probably not get this diagnosis. Although generally, I don't perform the stain unless I have some additional history or the patient tends to be younger. That does seem, seem to be the usual presentation setting for these lesions. Okay, let's go on to case number two. A uh, 60-year-old had a large mass uh, in the sinus. As you can tell over here, it is a remarkably large mass. Um, let's go and drive the case and um, see what uh, we can find. So in this case, I think you'll see there are multiple different fragments of tissue. I mean, this is just a duplicate, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's go to this one. And I'm actually purposely gonna go here just so that you can see in this example, I think all of you would readily be able to assess that this is an example of an inverted sinonasal papilloma. However, as you can then expand over slightly, I think you will notice that this now looks quite different and has taken on a much more ominous appearance of the epithelial cells. And now you can tell that there is remarkable pleomorphism and variation, loss of complete um, uh, stratification towards the uh, surface. And therefore, you can tell that this is probably an area of carcinomatous transformation. And again, if you go over to the other fragments, I think all of you will notice in these areas that they really do have a remarkable pleomorphism. In fact, there's even some spindle cell appearance to several of these. When you go up to high power, I don't think anyone would struggle to recognize that this is an example of um, a carcinoma. So let's go back to the presentation and just realize again that you, know, you always have to set it in the context of the non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma category, which is, of course, going to be one of the most common lesions, again, in the upper aerodigestive tract. 
the ribbon type appearance of the uh, squamous epithelium, where you have a very high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio without any areas of obvious squamous or keratin differentiation to the lesion can be a little bit more challenging to interpret. But again, a very strong and diffuse P40 reactivity should help you with that particular interpretation, recognizing that many of these in the upper area digestive tract are also related to HPV, as you can see confirmed here with a high risk in situ hybridization technique. So in this instance, this does happen to be a carcinoma exononasal papilloma. Um, the, this is uh, something that um, you will see quite um, frequently, although it is not the most common lesion. However, it definitely occurs with a greater frequency uh, in the oncocytic papilloma versus those of the inverted type. And I have not really ever seen one develop in an exophytic sinonasal papilloma. So you may have concurrent lesion, uh, predominantly benign tumor or predominantly malignancy, and the idea of these being either metachronous or synchronous. In fact, in my view, they are often synchronous, meaning they both present at the same time. So you will see both the benign and malignant, and you don't really have the arc of development. Development. It's difficult to do a specific what is the histologic feature of um, malignancy, but in my view, bone invasion, a loss of maturation, uh, overall disorganization, the sheer volume of the inflammatory uh, of the uh, tumor infiltrate, then a loss of transepithelial inflammatory infiltrate, and a remarkably increased number of mitoses, including atypical mitosis, certainly would put you into the carcinoma. So here you see a nice example of the transition where you can see that this is going from uh, the benign into the more malignant component over here. Another example where you can see them really juxtaposed nicely together where there is clearly some atypia and dysplasia present and then transforming into the area of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Another example here where you can see that there is remarkable um, pleomorphism present in the basal zone as it invades into the underlying stroma. Other areas here showing single cell infiltration into the stroma with an area that is otherwise showing uh, remarkable pleomorphism. Paradoxical maturation, when you see it within the proliferation, is usually indicative of uh, invasive quality as well. Sometimes you will not see the actual area of invasion. I mean, in my view, this is an area of invasion because you've lost the basement membrane here, but still it can be quite challenging to determine, and therefore it's the volume of the neoplastic proliferation that should sway you. Um, another example over here where you can see that there is a spindling off and then dropping off into the underlying stroma as an area of squamous differentiation. Um, loss of the uh, inflammatory component is actually one of the tip-offs to the diagnosis, although I'm going to show you an exclusion to that in a moment, but I think you'll see lots of little portrier microabscesses here in the benign component of the inverted papilloma, and then here in the malignant transformation, you have almost no inflammatory elements at all. So it's actually that loss of inflammatory elements that allows you to make that particular interpretation, and then of course areas of bone destruction, as you can see here with a true destruction of the bone, is going to be helpful for the diagnosis as well. P53 sometimes will be of help. You'll notice that the neoplastic proliferation is completely strong and diffusely nuclear reactive, indicating that it is not a wild type distribution. This brings me to DECAF2. This is actually one of the emerging categories within the new WHO. And this particular tumor um, is remarkably similar to inverted papilloma or the concept of carcinoma X uh, sinonasal papilloma. And it is an intraepithelial discohesive growth with lots and lots of in neutrophils um, and or in inflammatory cells. And unfortunately, the only way to reach this particular interpretation is either doing a fish uh, specifically for the DECAF2, whether it's a break apart or fusion. And recently, immuno was introduced that has been developed to the AF2C terminus, where you'll have a nuclear reaction. So on low power, it's a really, really voluminous tumor, right? I think all of you can already see that all of these little black dots are actually little portrier micro abscesses uh, of all of these inflammatory elements. But one of the things I've noticed in this tumor as well is the presence of all of these histiocytic components. You don't tend to see that in sinonasal papilloma alone. It is always in the carcinoma category in my view, and therefore when you see it is quite helpful for the interpretation. Again, here is an example where you can see that it is a very monotonous tumor population again. So this is not wildly pleomorphic as you see in squamous cell carcinoma de novo, meaning something that is not arising uh, as a fusion-related tumor or a translocation-related tumor. But this really, again, has a lot of inflammatory elements present within it. Here is another example here where you just have many, many inflammatory cells as part of the underlying tumor. This happens to be the fusion fish, 
Although, as I said, you can do either break apart or fusion, and they are commercially available in order to get to the correct interpretation for this particular tumor category. Now, it's considered emerging because at this point, there isn't really a therapeutic alternative related to the presence of this particular fusion. However, you know, with time, that may be the case, and they certainly do have a very... Um, indolent overall behavior in general. There have been isolated cases that have metastasized, but I do think as this particular category is expanded with more testing, we may have a broader spectrum of what happens with these tumors um, uh, overall. It's also important in the um, epithelial differential here with the carcinoma ex cyanonasal papilloma to in consider anticoanal polyp just because of the size and the clinical presentation. They're usually very, very large lesions that expand out into the nasopharynx, as you can see with this lesion. They will usually have an intact or metaplastic squamous epithelium, and then almost a complete absence of minor mucoserous glands in the stroma that is often quite edematous and fibrinoid. And then when you go on to higher power, either immediately below the surface epithelium or around vessels, you will see these isolated uh, bizarre appearing um, myofibroblasts. These are not to be construed as uh, squamous, uh, I mean, uh, spindle squamous cell carcinoma or rhabdomyosarcoma, although they will clearly be smooth muscle actin reactive. Okay, let's move on now to case number three, 78 year old, three year history of intermittent epistaxis and a large middle turbinate mass was identified in this particular patient. So, you know, whenever you talk about um, tumors and our evaluation of them, uh, I often want to uh, point out that they can be, you know, quite um, limited in their overall size. So as you looked at this case, you were like, dear God, is that all you got? And yes, in fact, it is. <laughs> you really have to struggle sometimes. So I think you can see that there is a surface epithelium over here. But interestingly, I do think that the neoplastic or lesional cells have actually expanded into the surface. And you can tell that there is a remarkable pagetoid spread, or it's arising from the surface and going down into the underlying uh, proliferation. I think you can see here, you know, that seems to be quite involved. And then you go into the deeper area um, of the lesion. And I'll just leave it there for a couple of seconds so that you're actually able to see that there is a remarkable um, plasmacytoid appearance to this or rhabdomyoblastic appearance or even, you know, plasmacytoid, whichever term you would like to use. But there's an eccentric location uh, to the cytoplasm in these particular uh, examples. So this, of course, is also going to bring to mind the notion of the small blue round cell tumor category. And I'm going to discuss that in the context here of the new um, nasal cavity chapter. You can tell that we actually only went down to 24 diagnoses from the previous edition. So the Suisneff complex was incorporated this time, as well as the HPV-related multiphenotypic cyanonasal carcinoma, with the emerging entities being the DECAF2 and the IDH2 hotspot mutation tumor category, with then updates in the rest of the um, teratocarcinosarcoma and some of the adenocarcinoma categories. So this happens to be an example of a Suisneff complex deficient carcinoma category. I think, as you know, there are multiple different components to the sweet sniff complex. And the reason why we say sweet sniff is because it's, of course, sweet sniff related matrix, matrix associated actin dependent regulator of chromatin subfamily one member one. So who would want to say that entire thing every time? So SMARC, either B1 or A1 is much easier or A4 is much easier to say in this particular context. So just clinically, they do tend to have a very high stage at initial presentation, and about 50% of the patients actually die of their disease in a relatively short time. And therefore, again, it's an important uh, lesion to recognize. So just in general, um, the SMART B1 has a carcinoma and an adenocarcinoma category, while the SMART A4 at this point is recognized as a carcinoma only. For the SMART B1 deficient carcinoma and A4, you shouldn't really have areas of either squamous or glandular differentiation. Clearly, the adenocarcinoma is going to have gland-like differentiation, in some cases, even the yolk sac-like features. And I think what you will notice, as I have suggested here, is that kind of basaloid to plasmacytoid or rhabdoid appearance that is quite characteristic of this tumor. And by de definition, they need to um, be either INI1, which is the immuno for SMARC B1, or BRG1, which is the immuno for SMARC A4. So if you look at the tumor, a basaloid morphology from low power, very easily identified lots of lobules of neoplastic cells in the underlying stroma. When you look at it on higher power, again, uh, a little bit of a monotony to it, but again, this kind of rhabdomyoblastic or plasmacytoid type differentiation with the areas having cytoplasm pulled out to one side. 
So when you do an immuno panel, as I've already suggested here, this is the only tumor category where either the INI1 or if you've in fact done the BRG1, uh, depending on which particular category you're in, is going to get you to the category. So if you never do INI1, you're never going to be able to make this particular interpretation. As you know, because there is a you know carcinoma as the underlying category, um, uh, the definition of this tumor is loss of one of these markers. So um, I will say in some cases where I struggle with trying to get to a particular interpretation, and because I've done a panel approach with my cases, having the loss of the INI1, you can kind of breathe a moment and go, oh, thank God, it's going to be an INI1 or SMARC-B1 deficient carcinoma, and you don't then need to worry about any of the other classification um, categories for it. So within that particular group, though, the differential is also going to include nut carcinoma. And as you know, this is, again, a very devastating tumor category uh, with a very poor outcome for these patients. But it's arranged in sheets and nests identical to the smart b one deficient or smart um, a 4 deficient group. Um, very monotonous, though, to the overall population. Vesicular nuclei with very, very prominent nucleoli, which is why the sun and nasal undifferentiated carcinoma category is, of course, included within that differential. As you know, very frequently abrupt, abrupt areas of uh, keratinization or keratin pearl formation are one of the tip offs to the diagnosis, while the inflammatory infiltrate is also seen. So you will notice that with the DECAF2 and with the nut carcinoma, both of those do tend to have a very acute inflammatory infiltrate component present within the lesion. So here is an example. I think you can tell it's quite monotonous in its overall distribution. Again, different from what I see in squamous cell carcinoma as a lesion where there's a profound pleomorphism, here it tends to be much more monotonous. Now, they are atypical, but they're all similarly atypical one to another. An area of abrupt um, keratinization, as you can see in the upper field here, uh, quite remarkable for this tumor. You'll notice this is pleomorphic as well. So it isn't that there is evidence of surface inclusion in the tumor, but it's a genuine finding deep within the tumor itself. Again, that very acute inflammatory infiltrate, and here this is to highlight the very open vesicular dominant nucleoli that make this particular diagnosis. And then, of course, the diagnosis is cinched with doing a nut immunohistochemistry. Again, this is really the only way in order to get to this diagnosis, because if you don't do the nut, it's never going to be something that you can confirm. Um, have done, you know, fish or uh, RT-PCR or some other technique, but just from an immunophenotypic expression, if you have not done the um, nut, you're not going to get it. Let me just go back for a second and show you that it's a very speckled nuclear distribution, so that is quite a characteristic for it. And I can tell you, I've seen many people fall for the trap in cytoplasmic reactivity. Cytoplasm is not a positive reaction for this, so you do need to depend on having it being a nuclear reaction. And then, of course, you know, just diagrammatically, what you see with the um, break apart. And here is an example of fish where you can tell that it has broken apart. And I will say, just because I like to put in something a little bit interesting periodically, this is a fish, a jellyfish taken from the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California. And the gene that produces the fluorescence in this jellyfish is what is used for the red uh, fluorochrome in fish. So ironically, uh, jellyfish are the source of what we use for um, fish as an inside you hybridization technique. Now, let me just also continue with the uh, differential where you can see that the neuroendocrine category is now one of the most significant in this book, um, incorporating grade uh, one, two, and three neuroendocrine tumors, and then neuroendocrine carcinoma as defined by either small cell, large cell, or Merkel cell um, as an overlying category. So as you know, the neuroendocrine tumor category is distributed everywhere, and certainly within the upper aerodigestive tract and salivary glands. Um, functional immun uh, imaging studies can be performed, especially those to the somatostatin analogs, such as SSTR2A, and therefore that gives you not only the localization, but also potentially a therapeutic alternative for these particular patients. And so here you can see a couple of examples where you can highlight the tumors um, in these particular patients, of course, this representing uh, metastatic disease as well. So um, the grade one, two, and three for the neuroendocrine tumor category is still not as well developed um, within the head and neck space, and certainly not within the sinonasal tract as it is in the you know, lung and GI tract. But the tumor categories still need to be recognized as the overarching uh, category group. And these are going to be further, I think, expanded over the next few years as these criteria are being developed. Um, recognize that the key 67 should be used, although at this particular point, again, the idea of what direct cutoffs are in order to put them into categories has not yet been well developed, and you should have co-expression of both epithelial as well as neuroendocrine markers with an intact P53 and RB.
If those are last, then you've transitioned into the carcinoma category rather than a neuroendocrine tumor category. So this is just an example of a grade one neuroendocrine tumor. It happens to be from the larynx where you have these very nice rosettes and very low grade lesion without mitotic figures. Here you can see mitosis and tumor necrosis in a grade two neuroendocrine uh, tumor. This is taken from the larynx where you will notice now that it is positive with either synaptophysin. Sometimes you will even have co-expression of calcitonin that is unrelated to anything in the thyroid gland. It just is an ectopic expression of calcitonin, but certainly can be quite confusing if you're not aware of it, while the RB is intact. So here you will notice it's a very nice, strong nuclear reaction in all of the neoplastic cells. Versus in the category here that I'm talking about, this kind of small blue round cell under the SMARC um, or sweet sniff complex deficient category, the neuroendocrine carcinoma category is the one that would be in the differential where you need to have both morphologic as well as immunophenotypic uh, differentiation of the neuroendocrine cell compartment. Lots of different patterns, the crushed artifacts, the high mitotic index, all of these things are quite similar to what you see in small cell carcinoma of the lung, but you really do need to see neuroendocrine features um, histologically. So on low power lobules and nests of tumor, you'll notice that there is tumor necrosis easily identified. Here you will notice again, a very high NC ratio molding, uh, lots of mitotic figures present. Another example here with a very, very fine and even nuclear chromatin distribution, sort of small chromocenters or maybe even a nucleolus here and there. And then of course, crush, crush artifact, which is quite commonly seen in these tumors and therefore makes it a little bit more difficult to interpret the immunohistochemistry. So remember, it needs to have both epithelial and neuroendocrine differentiation. Aberrant expression of other markers can be seen. I've incorporated TTF1 here, but others can also be identified. And of course, P16 is often co-expressed in these lesions and is not necessarily representative of an HPV association, although it is a little bit more common when it occurs within the oropharyngeal area. And again, global loss of RB is one of the findings that can be used to confirm the diagnosis. So very nicely, there's often a dot-like immunoreactivity pattern of the uh, keratins, as you will notice here. Of course, it does not have either P40, P63, or CK56, because it is not a squamous or epithelial type tumor in that sense. But synaptophysin can be seen in these tumors, as can the newer markers, such as INSM1, giving you a strong nuclear reaction throughout this particular lesion. So just to highlight that co-expression with other markers can be seen, as you will notice here with the TTF1. But again, that very, very nice loss of RB is very characteristic um, of the tumor category and therefore should help you with the differential consideration. Just to show you that P16 can be strongly positive, And of course, some of the cases will have um, in situ hybridization positive for high-risk HPV, especially when they develop within the oropharynx area. Again, very, very high P67 uh, index. Uh, this is something where, you know, you, we say greater than 20%, but it's probably closer to the 60 to 80% range as far as the proliferation index. So it's a really high proliferation index overall for the neuroendocrine carcinoma category, whether it's the small cell or the large cell um, category. So we also get now to sinonasal undifferentiated. The reason I'm including it here sort of at the end is because it is a diagnosis of exclusion where you had to have kind of gone through the sweet sniff complex. You needed to have done NUT. You needed to have done DECAF2. Um, you kind of have to have gone through other tumor categories before you can get to the undifferentiated carcinoma group. Just remember, it's usually remarkably destructive, no surface involvement uh, or dysplasia or carcinoma in situ large monotonous polygonal cells, open vesicular nuclear chromatin and prominent nucleoli, which of course is what I've been showing you all along as each of these other tumor categories have been carved out of the sinonasal undifferentiated. So sinonasal undifferentiated has actually shrunk each time the new book has come out. It's a smaller and smaller and probably much less frequent tumor category um, as we move forward with our ability to recognize other lesions. So on low power lobular um, nests of tumor, uh, bone destruction can certainly be seen uh, because it just will expand out into the adjacent paranasal sinuses or even skull base area. Very prominent uh, lymphatic and vascular invasion, as you can see, filling these vessels here. And then when you look in high power, you'll notice that it is a very open nuclear vesicular chromatin with a very prominent single central nucleolus within each of the neoplastic cells. So again, it should be positive for pancytokeratin. CK7 is also positive, by the way, but you should not have any differentiation with the epithelial, uh, squamous epithelial markers such as P40, P63, or CK56 uh, in this lesion. And now recently, um, IDH2 uh, or IDH1 
has been identified in these particular tumors and can be used as an immunophenotypic um, reaction to identify the lesion. So very strong pan-cytokeratin in this example. P16, again, can be expressed, but it isn't related to underlying HPV. A lack of markers with either P63, P40, or CK56. You'll get some highlighting of basal cells at the uh, basal zone, but the neoplastic cells are clearly non-reactive. And then here is a nice example of a strong and diffuse um, IDH1 or 2 uh, immunohistochemistry highlighting the neoplastic cells. And again, IDH1 uh, or two as a category for these particular tumors is one where maybe it is going to be its own entity, just like the sweet sniff complex uh, category. But at least at this particular edition of the book, it's still considered one of the emerging categories where maybe the definition will expand with some time. Okay, let's go on to case number four. Um, a 64-year-old presented with anosmia, and of course, a large mass was um, identified in the uh, sinonasal tract here. Let's go and uh, drive this particular slide. So again, you know, kind of a polypoid appearance to this. I think you will notice uh, even on this kind of intermediate power that there are multiple lobules of neoplastic cells that are easily identified. I will also point out there are a lot of calcifications just in this particular space. Let's go up here to a little higher power just to review the... Uh, population of cells. I think everyone agrees with me that it's a neoplasm, but you can tell that there's kind of an overall um, lobularity to it. There is some nuclear pleomorphism present here. Um, I think what's interesting is that you have these areas of um, epithelial differentiation um, and or epithelial compartment or something else, you know, but still when you look at it on high power, um, I think you will notice there are also some cells that kind of have um, vacuoles present within them as uh, lesional cells, although is it two different components or is it one? That's kind of the question in this particular case. I mean, I think it's um, identical going over here. It's not as if it's a different uh, lesion at all. You can just tell that there's a very good and well-developed fibrovascular stroma present within the background. Um, and again, it is a kind of monotonous overall population, although clearly when you go up to slightly higher power, I think you can see that there is some nuclear pleomorphism present within it. And then again, these isolated cells that kind of have a more um, epithelial quality to them or epithelioid quality to them. So, you know, this brings me now to the small blue round cell differential. Um, I've just highlighted all of the letters of the first group going down to spell Mr. Sleep. If you're, in fact, you know, a gynecologic pathologist, you can do Mrs. Leap instead. Um, but just recognize that there are a lot of tumors that we need to consider within the small blue round cell differential. Um, one of the first ones to at least consider, because it was incorporated into this book as well as a specific entity with the adamantinoma-like Ewing sarcoma category, it's a primitive round cell Sarcoma at this particular point, although people are debating should the adamantinoma like uh, be called a carcinoma instead of a sarcoma, and I'm not going to resolve that issue here. But just recognize that it is a lobulated architecture, often with peripheral palisading and a mixoid stroma with areas of squamous differentiation sometimes seen within the tumor. And sort of by definition, the CD99 in a membranous fashion with, L with uh, NKX 2.2 should help you reach that particular interpretation as well. And then for the adamantinoma like, CKPAN and either P40 or P63 should be immunoreactive in the neoplastic cells, all related still, of course, to the underlying fusion of the EWSR, most generally to FLY1, but of course, other translocation partners can be recognized as well. So when I look at the neoplastic cells, tumor necrosis easily identified, but it is a monotonous population. Here you can see another one where there is a little bit more pleomorphism to this case with tumor necrosis easily identified. Um, and kind of a, a discohesion to the neoplastic cells. I don't get the sense that they're all uh, hanging together. In fact, you can see in this high power field that they do have a very high NC ratio and tend to be uh, discrete isolated units. So again, for me, the differential is going to be that small blue round cell differential uh, for this neoplastic category. Sometimes they're a little bit more nested, as you see here. And again, very characteristic uh, chromatin distribution with that kind of coarse to slightly fine nuclear chromatin appearance. So when one looks at the immunoprofile for this tumor, again, the pan-cytokeratin um, can be seen in uh, Ewing sarcoma alone, but certainly within the adamantinoma-like should be positive, and then variable expression with a whole variety of different markers. So again, if you're not doing a panel, you're not going to recognize that those particular findings are seen. So here's an example. I'll show this with the P40. Here's an example with the P63, another one with the CK56, just showing you that it really is an epithelial type differentiation to this particular tumor. 
a membranous type immunoreactivity with CD99, while there is a strong nuclear reaction with NKX2.2. As you know, the NKX2.2 is the downstream target of EWSR1 fly1 fusion, and therefore it is considered oncogenic in this particular um, setting and allows you to reach the interpretation. Of course, if you wanted to do fish, you would be able to identify it with the EWSR1 uh, uh, fish uh, as a uh, break apart probe. One of the other things to consider, of course, is also um, many times you'll have a remarkable pseudoepitheliometer hyperplasia. Um, in this particular case, it is actually associated with an NK T cell lymphoma, which I'm going to show in a moment. But whenever I have areas of squamous differentiation like this, the adamantinoma like Ewing category, as well as some of these others, you also need to consider the notion of the NK T cell lymphoma, which is also angiodestructive and angioinfiltrative, uh, angiocentric, if you will. Uh, where the neoplastic cells have gone into and destroyed the vessels in a paratheliomatous distribution. Of course, a different parallel will be identified here with um, both the NK or T cell markers present and also um, LCA, hence the reason for including it in the panel for these lesions. One of the other small blue round cell categories that you have got to consider is the pituitary neuroendocrine tumor category. You know, we used to call it pituitary adenoma, but it's recognized that they are also, also risk stratified into grade one, two, and three lesions. Um, so it's better to call them a neuroendocrine tumor because uh, they are part of that particular overarching group. So remember that when you talk about where the lesions are, here is the um, uh, sphenoid sinus in both cases, but you'll see that it's immediately below the cella with the pituitary uh, easily identified uh, there. So if you have a tumor developed without anything in the pituitary, then it is ectopic, but in general, it's direct extension from the sphenoid sinus. As you can see with these two lesions, the sphenoid sinus tumor, I'm sorry, the um, pituitary tumor has expanded directly into the sphenoid sinus, and that's where it's being biopsied. So I think no one would miss the diagnosis if you were looking at this particular case from a neurosurgeon submitting the material to you, but it's because an ENT surgeon is submitting it that sometimes we are led astray and don't think of the diagnosis. So it's important to recognize that there's a whole bunch of different patterns that can be seen in this, the organoid and glandular, insula, festooned, ribbon, single cell, I mean, there are a whole bunch because it is a neuroendocrine tumor, and so you can have lots and lots of different patterns of growth. The, epi the epithelial cells, again, will also have quite a remarkable variation, ranging from polygonal and plasmacytoid to more cuboidal, spindle, and even uh, round cell appearance. Just remember that the neuroendocrine chromatin distribution should be seen in these tumors, and you can see it when you look on high power for sure. Tumor necrosis is not uncommonly present, and of course, profound pleomorphism can be seen, whether it's part of the underlying tumor or just part of endocrine organ uh, atypia, it definitely can be seen. But by definition, atypical mitoses and no perineural or lymphovascular invasion should be seen uh, in the pituitary neuroendocrine tumor category. So again, polypoid tumors, when you go and look at it like this, you can see that it is a blue cell neoplasm. Uh, so again, uh, lots of um, background, a fairly low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio for these particular cells below an intact surface epithelium over here. Um, but sometimes you can have this, you know, remarkable rosette type appearance. You can see that there is bone destruction as well in this area. And that bony destruction, because it is growing through from the cella in most instances, and therefore there will be bone destruction as it expands into that space. Tumor necrosis can easily be identified in these tumors as well and should not dissuade you from the diagnosis. But in general, it's a small blue round cell category set within this vascularized stroma. And I can tell you when you have a case like this, those are all of the neoplastic cells. But if they don't tell you anything, you would look at that and say, oh, this is just chronic inflammation, chronic rhinosinusitis, next case. But in fact, it is a pituitary neuroendocrine tumor that is infiltrated into the stroma in this particular linear fashion. So whenever you see a lot of what you think are inflammatory cells, but on high power don't quite make it, uh, you need to think about a neoplastic proliferation. Of course, when it's in a setting like this with a very nice pseudo rosettes and the nuclear chromatin distribution, it's a little bit easier. When you get to profound pleomorphism like this, it's a much more difficult category to be able to recognize. And just know, again, that when you're doing your panel approach, the keratins and the neuroendocrine markers are going to be immunoreactive. But in order to get it into this particular category, you will notice that I've included um, T-PIT, PIT1, and SF1. These are the overarching family. 
of how they are being um, recognized now, both in the CNS book as well as in the neuroendocrine book for the fifth edition, where these are required to be able to put it into tumor classes first as the underlying drivers of neoplasia. And then after you have that, you will notice that the CK pan or uh, epithelial uh, markers are going to be present along with a variety of neuroendocrine type markers, synaptophysin and chromogranin as examples here, and then recognize that a variety of different specific pituitary hormones can be identified, prolactin most frequently, but also FSH, LA, ACTH, and TSH or GH, recognizing that sometimes you may have co-expression of some of these markers, but recognizing most importantly that you have neuroendocrine and epithelial uh, reactivity foremost. So just an example here of the prolactin, where it is a very strong and diffuse reaction in the neoplastic cells of this pituitary neuroendocrine tumor. So the correct diagnosis for the case that I drove uh, for this is, in fact, an olfactory neuroblastoma. And I think all of you probably recognize that. I'm going to give you a, a bit more about it, though, so don't think that's the only diagnosis. But in this case, you know, it's always arranged in kind of a circumscribed lobule or nest of tumor. So whenever I see a tumor in the sinonasal tract that has a very remarkable lobular distribution, olfactory neuroblastoma must be included in the differential every single time, recognizing again that this particular tumor has a very, very specific location as well, but in general is kind of our sine qua non category for the small blue round cell tumor group. They can have um, focal or aberrant epithelial, myogenic, or even melanocytic differentiation. So here you can see a very large tumor as it expands into the skull base, um, but in general, it's a very, very lobular pattern. So here you can see a lobular architectural arrangement on low power, another one highlighting that lobular architectural distribution. So I think that is one of the most important things to recognize in this tumor is always think about olfactory neuroblastoma whenever you have a lobular architecture. When you go up to high power, you will notice that there is a very monotonous population, although there is some multinucleation and pleomorphism present, so this would be a grade two lesion. This over here is actually an example of surface epithelium being pulled down into it, but just to highlight that sometimes that separation of is it epithelial differentiation or not may be quite challenging in this particular tumor. Um, isolated uh, mitotic figures, when they begin to be seen, move the tumor into a different grade. So this would actually now be a grade two tumor. And I'm highlighting this just to show you how my panel approach assisted in this case. So initially I had done the panel on those uh, little isolated cells in the background because I thought, oh, this just seems a little bit weird and too much um, of a quote, epithelial differentiation. They were all strongly keratin reactive, but in this individual cell grouping, and so I went and asked, um, is there any known history in the patient? <laughs> of course there is, but they never tell you that, right? Mm. Lobular breast carcinoma 20 years before. So ladies and gentlemen, an example of metastatic lobular breast carcinoma to a grade two olfactory neuroblastoma. When are you ever going to have that again? And now you can go back and redrive that case later and try and look for all of those cells. <laughs> okay, it is important also in the small blue round cell differential to think about rhabdomyosarcoma. As you know, they can be um, alveolar in this particular case, and the alveolar type, especially in the sinonasal tract, is usually in the adult population group, which is in the differential uh, in general for these particular tumors, uh, a you know kind of polypoid appearance to it, the dilapidated brick wall where they kind of fall into the center of these alveolar spaces. And then again, when you look at it on high power, that plasmacytoid, rhabdoid, uh, or eccentric location to the cytoplasm is very characteristic for rhabdo, but I've also showed you that previously for the sweet sniff complex deficient carcinoma category. So just remember that that particular pattern is not unique at all to this lesion. But you will have muscle markers present. And so again, if you're doing your panel approach and have included a Desmond initially, you should be able to get to the diagnosis. But remember that in this particular case, the CAM 5.2 or other cytokeratins will be positive in about 50% of rhabdomyosarcomas of the alveolar subtype. Of course, here is the myogenin to highlight that it is still part of that category. So I've showed you two tumors so far, the TFCP2 rhabdomyosarcoma, as well as rhabdo here, just as an uh, alveolar type that can have co-expression of keratin. So again, it is really, really important to have obtained multiple different immunohistochemical studies to get to your diagnosis without doing it just on a targeted one 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 approach. Otherwise, you will miss the interpretation. Boxo one of course, is the major translocation partner um, with either PAX3 or PAX7 um, as the fusion partner in these cases. Okay, let's transition now to case number five, 
79-year-old, several previous uh, biopsies for papillary and verrucous lesions, and she now presents with eight different lesions, this one from the buccal cavity being what is going to be um, driven. So let's go and look at this particular case. I am going to sort of turn this a little bit just to highlight it a little more easily. So as I look at this, uh, you know, I can look at both pieces. This one obviously has similar findings. You will notice that there is a surface epithelial uh, proliferation that is expanded, but here you can see that there is actually a profound um, increase in the amount of keratin, and when I look at that, it's actually also keratin. In other words, there is no uh, nuclei present within it, and it comes to a very abrupt end. Um, actually, I want to just drive down here for a second. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, to show you this particular piece, because I just think it shows those abrupt areas a little bit better. So you have uh, squamous epithelium with this orthokeratosis. Suddenly it stops. You get it over here. Suddenly it stops. Uh, over here, it restarts. So there is this um, undulation to the surface. I think you can see that undulating surface over here, but then these abrupt areas that um, allow you to reach a very, very, you know, remarkable line of demarcation uh, to this. When I go up to high power and look at the area, though, I think you will notice with me that there is not really any uh, dysplastic change to this. There is some uh, slight alteration in the uh, way in which they mature to the surface with this remarkable granular layer, and then the orthokeratosis overlying. But there's no true dysplasia that you see in this example. But again, with this very, very thickened area of um, ortho uh, or hyperkeratosis. So when I think about this, um, proliferative verrucous leukoplakia is the entity that this represents. It is a lesion that requires a remarkable correlation with the clinical findings because it is usually something where you've had multiple different samples taken over time with the same uh, overall appearance. So this happens to be one of the earlier lesions, a corrugated ortho or parahyperkeratotic lesion that is not reactive. With this profound keratosis, the orthokeratosis represents uh, more than one half of the underlying surface epithelial thickness. The wave-like or crests and uh, spikes that you see Sometimes it's a little bit more flat rather than being quite that way, but it is usually then a very thinned epithelium below with still that profoundly thickened orthokeratotic layer and recognizing skip zones as well with an adjacent uh, area of acute inflammation. So as I look at this, those corrugations are quite easily identified, very prominent granular layer, usually a loss of the reti without any significant architectural distortion, and yet it does have this profound uh, overlying surface ortho or hyperkeratosis with very little in the way of inflammation. So here is a very nice example, quite thickened in this case, remarkably thickened here is an orthokeratotic lesion, and if you go from there to there, you can tell it's way more than the underlying uh, surface. This is the example here where you can see that there is a very abrupt zone of transition from the adjacent epithelium into the area of lesional tissue. Then you go into the second category within this uh, group of uh, proliferative verrucous leukoplakia or PVL, where it's a bulky hyperkeratotic epithelial proliferation that is not reactive, where you have these bulbous uh, reti that coalesce below, um, separation artifacts between the epithelium and stroma, often with a very prominent lichenoid area, and usually involving the gingiva or maybe soft palate areas, the most risky epithelium. But it's one where you kind of are between, it's not quite just the abrupt and corrugated area, but you're not yet at carcinoma. So in this case, it's usually a very profound keratosis, loss of the reti, um, the risky sites being involved with kind of a linear appearance to the base of this, where it doesn't expand into the underlying surface. So here is an example of that epithelial uh, surface that is thickened. Of course, tangential sectioning with any of the verrucous or papillary lesions is quite easy to identify. Another example here where it's a remarkable variation and of course, tangential sectioning limiting you in your interpretation. Then finally, you get to either suspicious for squamous cell carcinoma, where there really is a three to four times thickness of the epithelium over the adjacent uninvolved um, epithelium. Clubbing and bulbous, blunt, downward projecting reti pegs often displacing either the basement membrane or in fact displacing areas of the uh, skeletal muscle, especially if it's in the uh, tongue region. And then intraepithelial microabscesses with keratin pearl formation is quite characteristic as well. And of course, if it's a verrucous squamous cell carcinoma or even the barniculate carcinoma category, you'll have quite a bit of church spire type keratosis as well. So in this case, it's just the voluminous appearance of the overlying surface epithelium that is so much thicker than the adjacent um, epithelium, tends not to go below the uh, 
adjacent uh, epithelium in many instances, although it may begin to expand below it. And the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, this separation of Veruca squamous cell carcinoma from uh, other types of carcinoma definitely needs to be considered. So here is an example. I think if you look at the epithelium over here, that's the thickness. And you go from here to here, and you can tell that this is a remarkably thickened um, epithelium. Another example over here with the uh, orthohyperkeratosis, and then here is the development of the carcinoma. You can see that it is displacing the skeletal muscle. Another example here, again, if you look at the upper areas of this, you can see that it is a very small area. And over here, again, a very, very thickened epithelium that is pushing down and displacing. So in general, my view of this particular tumor is that it is the volume of the epithelial proliferation that puts you into the category rather than anything related to dysplasia uh, or architectural uh, changes otherwise. You do need to separate it from other lichenoid mucositis where you can see an example here with just hyperkeratosis, another example here of traumatic hyperkeratosis where there is keratin deposited along the surface, but it tends not to be ortho hyperkeratosis and usually has um, a lot of acute inflammation or even fungal elements associated with it. Benign uh, alveolar ridge uh, keratosis can also be seen in this example where you have um, epithelium, but just remember, again, it's not a very thickened space. And finally, um, tobacco pouchitis, where you can see that it is an area of leukoplakia, but not nearly the same as what you see in PVL, although in this case, it does have a ring around the collar type appearance where there is a hyperkeratotic lesion immediately around the tooth root or the junction with the tooth, and that is one of the more ominous areas to examine. Okay, let's go now to case number six. 30-year-old presented with a three to four week history of a uh, left alveolar ridge lesion, and uh, let's drive this for a couple of moments here. So again, two uh, pieces of tissue. Uh, I always like to go and look at the surface, and I think you can see that there is surface epithelium over here, but then it is actually denuded and lost in this particular space with some of the remaining surface epithelium on the side. So again, um, the idea of is it arising from the surface? Is it involving the surface? What is the surface uh, relationship to it? And in this case, I don't think the surface is actually involved, even though there is quite a remarkable um, uh, denuding uh, area of ulceration. When I look at this on higher power, I think you can see that there is a spindle cell population below. Um, in fact, it does go out into the adjacent fibrous connective tissue stroma. But when I look at this, I think what is of interest to me in this case is that there's kind of a um, bipolar appearance to it. So there's a bipolarity to many of the cells. They have abundant uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm. Uh, sometimes the area giving you a notion of could it be a ganglion type cell or not. And then of course there is quite a rich inflammatory infiltrate present within some of the spaces as well. It is not seen in every single field, but certainly, you know, when I look at a cell like that, the idea that maybe there's some sort of um, axonal or even gangliocytic type differentiation certainly needs to um, be considered. So when I think about this uh, tumor, it is an example of an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. Just know that it is a myofibroblastic and fibroblastic spindle cell lesion uh, within the uh, many different places uh, in the body, but within the aerodigestive tract. Um, just know that the larynx and oral cavity can certainly be affected with these lesions quite frequently. Um, tobacco uh, intubation trauma, even post-transplantation, has been reported and sometimes even in association with EBV. Recognize that they are quite common in adults, although within the head and neck they can occur within the um, pediatric age group as well. So they often are a, a polypoid lesion that projects into the lumen. Surface can be ulcerated and is not the source of the lesion. And it's arranged in this kind of storeform to fascicular growth pattern, edematous mixoid to fibromyxoid stroma. Um, easily identified mitoses, and then, of course, this very rich inflammatory infiltrate of either lymphocytes, histiocytes, eosinophils, plasma cells, and sometimes even neutrophils. So again, it is on low power, this very uh, mixoid uh, proliferation type appearance to it. The spindle cells are quite enlarged and sometimes have this fibrillar quality with a low NC ratio, axonal spider-like is sometimes what is used to describe it. And I think when I look at areas like this, I think those interlacing small fascicular architectural groups are certainly quite easy to identify. Here again, you will notice um, kind of a uh, slightly pleomorphic population of cells, but this axonal type appearance to it, a rich inflammatory infiltrate here being highlighted with um, neutrophils as well as plasma cells. Um, and again, the nuclei often have a, a very high NC ratio, 
but in other areas, they'll be quite low. So, you know, when I look at this, I don't think that's a terribly high NC ratio for that cell that has all of these projections coming off it as kind of axonal projections. When you have very, very easily identified extensions like this from the cytoplasm, again, you're thinking about things like rhabdomyosarcoma even um, in this particular differential. One of the things I do like to see is intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions. They're actually quite commonly identified um, in this tumor, and I do like to look for them specifically. So when you think about the immuno, about 50% of these cases will have um, an ALK-associated uh, finding, often including intranuclear inclusions for it. But remember, it's myofibroblastic, so any one of the various markers for smooth muscle differentiation will be present. But you should have then negativity with the keratins and um, markers of melanocytic differentiation. So here is an example of ALK, just to highlight that it is, in fact, um, identified within the uh, intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions in many of these cells. There are actually different patterns depending on the translocation partner. I don't have time to go into that today, but just know that that is the case for many of these lesions. It is interesting that the ALK is present um, quite uniformly in the pediatric population, but ALK is not often as often expressed in the adult population, and so that can be much more challenging as an interpretation of an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor that does not have ALK associated with it. You do need to have considered embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Remember that the rhabdos are quite common in the head and neck space, much more so than the genitourinary tract. But in general, embryonal is something that occurs within the first decade of life and is, of course, going to have a perivascular distribution. So here is an example uh, below an intact um, surface epithelium. I think you can see a little bit of the surface over here and over here. Uh, this has kind of an accentuation below it, so a cambium layer immediately below the surface epithelium and then a bit more hypocellular or myxoid. This is another example here with just a very spindle cell architecture, a bit more epithelioid quality to this embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Great strap differentiation in this particular example where you can see the cross striations beautifully even just on high power h &E. Then remember, pleomorphic sarcoma, of course, is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion as well, but can be seen and the idea of inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor being incorporated into it, but recognize that this is going to kind of be a diagnosis of exclusion again, where no other immunophenotypic markers have been identified to give you a line of differentiation. So lots and lots of profound nuclear pleomorphism in this spindled population. Another example here, um, kind of an epithelioid quality to this one with a profound number of... Um, mitotic figures as well as atypia. Another example here of multinucleated giant cells throughout below an intact um, surface respiratory epithelium. So sometimes the diagnosis of uh, pleomorphic sarcoma is obvious just on h &E, but you do still have to have done a variety of different markers in order to get to it, because of course the diagnosis is one of exclusion rather than uh, just coming up with it de novo. Let's now go to case number seven, 72 year old presented with a long history of an on again, off again mass, seems to be staying uh, larger at this particular time. And so as I look at this case, I think you will notice that there is an area of um, adjacent uh, salivary gland. It's always nice to see the adjacent salivary gland so that you know that you are in a salivary gland rather than somewhere else. But then I think you will notice that as you look at the salivary gland over here, there is a destructively infiltrative tumor along the border. I'm gonna just highlight an area like this for a moment so that you can see that it is a, a sclerotic nodule. And in fact, that is all that remains uh, in this particular case. Um, but as you go into other areas like this, I think you can see that there is this gorgeous micropapillary type architectural appearance. Um, when you look over here, you have kind of a cribiform type appearance uh, with central comedonecrosis. And in fact, if you go to super high power, you will notice that all of the cells in the background are profoundly pleomorphic, spindled, and sarcomatous in their overall architectural appearance. And so, in fact, in this case, you have multiple different tumor patterns arising from a single tumor cell. So in this example, salivary duct carcinoma, very aggressive um, apocrine-type uh, tumor that resembles apocrine-type breast carcinoma with a very strong and diffuse nuclear androgen receptor reactivity, generally um, arising within the parotid gland, and uh, many times it is actually a uh, finding that you see after a pleomorphic adenoma. So if you look at the imaging studies, you will notice that there's quite a bit of tumor necrosis and degeneration. But what I like to highlight is the area of calcification. That is the residual component of the pleomorphic adenoma that now you're able to identify in this patient. They often have surface erosion and ulceration, and of course can be remarkably sized and for any resident who may be listening, you do need to submit one section per centimeter of the tumor.
Okay, so unencapsulated, poorly circumscribed, invasive into ev everything adjacent to them. Multinodularity is common. Fibrosis and often a coexisting pleomorphic adenoma can be identified in about 80% of the cases. Prominent perineural and lymphovascular invasion, common necrosis, desmoplastic stroma, very high mitotic index. And of course, we do look for the areas of the papillary cribriform or band-like pattern that gives you the Roman bridge type architecture. But just in general, it's a very high grade neoplastic proliferation. So in this example, here is the area of benign pleomorphic adenoma with heavy sclerosis, and then you can see the carcinoma has developed out of this particular central area. Another example of the central area of sclerotic pleomorphic adenoma with now a very profound uh, proliferation of this cribriform appearance to the neoplastic um, salivary duct carcinoma component. They are usually widely infiltrative, so this is an example of the residual pleomorphic adenoma and then clearly much more than uh, a millimeter of tumor going out, and therefore a widely infiltrative tumor into the adjacent parenchyma. Lots of uh, tumor necrosis, uh, areas of previous calcification can usually be identified as well. And again, this cribriform architectural appearance, uh, tumor central necrosis, easily identified in profound neoplastic cells. And this kind of uh, characteristic Roman bridge type appearance when we see it is of course very characteristic of apocrine differentiation. Perineural and intraneural invasion is usually quite easily identified as well. And remember that it usually has marked or to profound nuclear pleomorphism. Uh, still, you know, ample cytoplasm that can range anywhere from granular to oncocytic. And of course, the apocrine morphology is usually easily identified. So here you can see a nice area of that uh, crib forming with the Roman bridge type formation. Very classic punched out appearance. If I were to say you were in the breast in this example, I don't think that you would disagree with me. Um, and you would think, okay, well, that's either a DCIS or maybe an invasive carcinoma. Now, I purposely did this little uh, animation just to share, say that they are all apocrine carcinoma. There's no such thing as a non apocrine salivary duct carcinoma. So there may be some variation in the patterns of growth. Here you can see sarcomatoid, micropapillary, and mucin rich with the osteoclastic type giant cell type, not so common. So I'm not going to show that here. But you know, this is an example of sarcomatoid transformation. Here you'll notice the area of epithelial differentiation and then a very nice transition to the sarcomatous area, more sarcomatous transformation. And I can tell you, if you're looking at a core needle biopsy and that is all you get, the idea of dealing with a sarcomatoid um, salivary duct carcinoma is going to be very difficult for you to reach as an interpretation, but just recognize that it certainly uh, can be seen. And in fact, will uh, have AR immunoreactivity. The micropapillary pattern, similar to micropapillary patterns anywhere um, uh, in the body, like you see in breast or GI tract or even lung. An example of mucinous differentiation can also be seen. And again, it depends on if you're seeing the entire tumor or just a core needle. I mean, if you went a core needle through that mucinous area, you would probably um, not necessarily think about salivary duct carcinoma as your first in the differential. You know, I always like to put things a little bit in historical context as well. So this is taken from the papal apartments in the Vatican City, a painting by Raffaello. And you may say, well, what the devil does this have to do with salivary gland pathology? Well, I'm going to show you. Here are all of the uh, people in the School of Athens. And of course, I'm going to highlight this dude way in the corner, because look at this. He has a pleomorphic adenoma. So here you have a pleomorphic adenoma present in the literature from the early 1500s. So just be aware that they have been around a long time and they often are quite hyalinized and sclerotic. And therefore all that remains is gonna be a sclerotic nodule. So just, you can do morphologic or you can do uh, immunophenotypic or maybe even molecular confirmation of the benign pleomorphic adenoma in the background, but just know that salivary duct carcinoma will frequently have that. There are a number of different, both activating mutations and amplifications of oncogenes, as well as either inactivating mutations or deletions in tumor suppression genes. And because of this, even though you do have HER2 amplification in the salivary duct carcinoma XPA category, just be aware because of its upstream nature, um, you may in fact not have response to Herceptin therapy. So even though people ask you to do the HER2, and I'm gonna show you an example here in a moment, just be aware that it may not always give a positive outcome for the patient. So androgen receptor is really what you need to do in this particular case, but they will be epithelial marker reactive as well as CK7 reactive, but it is the uh, androgen AR positive appearance that is quite characteristic of these tumors. And if it isn't there, then it's probably not a salivary duct carcinoma and you need to think about something else. 
So very strong and diffuse AR immunoreactivity as part of the apocrine differentiation in this tumor. And just to highlight that HER2 can be seen in a very nice membranous distribution without necessarily having a therapeutic context. P63 and CK56 or P40 are not reactive in the neoplastic cells, but they can be seen around the luminal aspect in several instances. Now, I will say sometimes in the setting of a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, um, doing a P53 and AR concurrently will allow me to highlight both the PA and the salivary duct carcinoma, where you have transitions from non-reactive in the PA to strongly reactive in the area of salivary duct carcinoma. And sometimes I will use this to allow me to give a more um, accurate percentage of the neoplastic cells that are positive. Um, in this setting, you also need to think about metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. As you know, the skin of the head and neck is a very common site. Of course, melanoma can also be seen, but that would give you a different uh, appearance. But just recognize these large areas of neoplastic cells that show squamous differentiation, often a very profound keratinization with central keratin debris formation as it uh, metastasized to the salivary gland, or sometimes even direct extension from the overlying skin of the face as it goes into the salivary gland. But it's still usually um, very profound squamous differentiation that allows you to recognize it. Prominent lymphovascular invasion, again, would give you the notion that it has metastasized to this location rather than necessarily arising from this space. And again, areas of keratinization and squamous differentiation with these very nice intercellular borders or bridges can give you the clue to that particular diagnosis. But again, in the separation from salivary duct carcinoma, they're going to be P63, P40, and CK56 immunoreactive. Some of them may also be from oropharyngeal tumors, and therefore if a P16 is done and then follow on with uh, high-risk HPV, you would be able to document that it is in fact a mucosal-based primary metastasizing to these areas rather than a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Again, the high-grade uh, salivary duct carcinoma as a category and high-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma can certainly have overlap. But again, in most cases, the CK56, P40, and C63 will help you in reaching that, although there are cases of mucoep that do not show uh, CK56 or P40, but in general, they will show the characteristic mammal 2 fusion that can be seen in these tumors. So here is an example. I think you can tell that it is very high-grade lots of tumor necrosis and um, a lymphovascular invasion. When you look on high power, I think it'd be very hard pressed to say, oh yeah, this is a classic for mucoepidermoid carcinoma. I mean, there are some areas of mucinous type differentiation, but still it is quite challenging to see. An example here, if I were to say, is this the micropapillary salivary duct or high-grade mucoep, I think you would have a challenge reaching that particular interpretation just on H&E alone. Sometimes you get areas of more transitional type epithelium that allow you to reach that particular interpretation on h and &E, but just in general, it's quite challenging to reach. Areas of sarcomatoid transformations can sometimes be seen in mucoepidermoid carcinoma high grade as well, and therefore can be quite challenging. Let's go to the next category. Um, a 69-year-old presented with a history of prostate carcinoma and melanoma and during imaging was found to have a, prost a, um, a lesion in the parotid gland. And so let's go and drive this particular case. Um, I would like to just highlight the patterns of growth here rather than documenting that there is any evidence of um, infiltration. But I think you can see there are multiple nodules of tumor in this example. There is a bosselated appearance or maybe infiltrative appearance here to this pattern. And from low power, I think you can tell that there is this kind of background mixoid appearance to it. This is not a chondroid mixoid ma matrix. This is just a mixoid matrix material. And as I look throughout this particular area, you may say, oh, there's glandular differentiation. But in fact, when you go up to high power, this is all just vacuolization and separation artifact. And there is no evidence of true glandular differentiation in this. There's just, in fact, a monotonous population of a single cell uh, pattern of neoplastic cells. Now, they can appear as either uh, epithelioid or polygonal, sometimes even appearing more spindled in some areas. And again, this area where they just combine and aggregate around open luminal spaces can really be quite tricky to be able to say, is that glandular differentiation or is it just all part of a background myoepithelial population? And so the myoepithelial rich lesions, I'm gonna leave this on for just a couple seconds so that you can tell there is actually a very rich 
grouping of what to think about when you're considering the myoepithelial rich lesions. And I'm not going to have time to go through all of these at all. I'm just going to show a couple of them, but just recognize that there is a very well-developed um, approach to myoepithelial type lesions, whether they're occurring in a salivary gland or in a minor salivary gland location in other upper aerodigestive tract locations. Again, I use a panel approach when I do this because otherwise you're going to miss the patterns of immunoreactivity for the various markers where you're trying to highlight, is it a monotonous population of a single cell group or is it in fact a population of cells that highlights a number of different areas? And so when I highlight the panel here, I think you will see that there's a lot of overlap between each of the various categories as you go down and it's instead the pattern of immunoreactivity that is just as important as the fact of being positive or negative. So of course, pleomorphic adenoma, right? It is the most cons um, common salivary gland neoplasm. So you have to think about it every time, no matter what. Um, I think everyone likes to see that characteristic chondroid matrix material, and this is it. And so when you do see it, it can be quite focal, but still when it's present, helps you reach your interpretation. Areas like this, though, when it's a much more myoepithelial rich area with more of a mixoid pattern, can be much more challenging to reach an interpretation. And sometimes if all you have is a monotonous uh, myoepithelial population that is plasmacytoid. This is most frequently seen in palatal lesions. It can be quite difficult to say I'm dealing with a pleomorphic adenoma. Epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma is also another one of those tumor categories that has a biphasic appearance of both an inner luminal ductal differentiation versus myoepithelial cells, quite commonly as the tumor category within the carcinoma X pleomorphic adenoma grouping. But here you can see again, if I just showed that, you would say, oh, doesn't that look like the previous case? But you know, now you move over one field, and I think you will now notice that there is the central area that looks quite different from the cells that surround it that have a more cleared myoepithelial appearance to them. And so as you look on now low power for these areas, I think you can see that there is a central luminal differentiation in these groups that is quite easily um, picked out. But remember, it can also be seen in an oncocytic tumor that would be much more challenging, as you can see here, because the oncocytic epithelium is identified and kind of over, um, uh, overexposes the region, if you will, and therefore it's hard to tell that all of these little myoepithelial cells around the outer aspect are present. But if you do immunohistochemistry, you'll notice a central highlighting with an epithelial marker that is quite different from various myoepithelial markers. And I mean, showing smooth muscle actin, I could just have easily have shown a SOX10 or an S100, GFAP, or any of a variety of other myoepithelial markers. But importantly, highlighting a dual population in this example. So this case happens to be a myoepithelial carcinoma. Um, the separation from myoepithelioma is really the presence of no invasion, no necrosis, and no pleomorphism or increased mitotic figures. So this is an example of the myoepithelial tumor. You can tell that it is in a streaming type architecture. Here is another one which is a much more reticulated architectural pattern with this mucinous type uh, material in the background much more easily identified mucinous type material here, um, even giving you a plasmacytoid type appearance to the neoplastic cells with that background uh, mixoid to fibrous connective tissue. Now, myoepithelioma can also be quite remarkably cellular, as you can see here, and therefore give it a much more difficult diagnosis without being able to separate between the lesions. Sometimes even a linear architecture, as you can tell from these cells here. Um, that plasmacytoid, uh, rhabdoid, or, you know, eccentric location, again, I've highlighted in several of the tumors today because it really can be quite difficult to be able to separate, and this is the reason for doing the immunopanels in order to be able to separate these neoplastic groupings. So here I'm showing a very nice area of lymphatic invasion, and with lymphatic invasion, you clearly are now not dealing with a benign category, and we've moved to myoepithelial carcinoma. Uh, usually a much more cellular lesion, a much higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. It will expand out and invade into the adjacent parenchyma, sometimes showing a much um, a higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. But other areas may show this very profound stromal fibrous connective tissue deposition, giving you a jigsaw type puzzle, uh, uh, appearance. Tumor necrosis or increased mitotic activity, usually easily identified. Here, a nice area of tumor necrosis with a bit more nuclear pleomorphism easily identified in the plastic cells in the background. And this as an example of kind of a more rhabdoid appearance to the myoepithelial population of this tumor. 
Mitoses are usually greatly increased in myoepithelial carcinoma versus what you see in uh, just a benign category. So again, you will notice almost all of the markers are positive without the HMV45, of course, but it really is something where they don't all react in every single case, but it is highlighting a single cell population, and that's the most important thing for you to recognize as you look at it. The soft tissue neoplasms are frequently INI1 lost, but the salivary gland neoplasms are not. So they are usually have an INI1 reten retention. Just to highlight now several, CK pan and CK7, just as examples of epithelial markers, SOX10 and S100 in these examples of myoepithelial predominant, meaning it's the only pattern that you see. Areas of CK56 and P40, it could have been P63, highlighting all of the neoplastic cells, where here you can see calponin and even GFAP, highlighting several different neoplastic groups. Now you'll notice with the GFAP, it's much stronger in the upper portion of the field than the lower. And so again, there is some variation in the immunoreactivity pattern. Let's go now to case number nine, um, developed jaw pain and TMJ. However, a lump was identified in this particular patient and there you can see where the tumor is. Um, let's go and uh, drive this case for a couple of seconds. I think you will notice that, you know, uh, the area of uh, tonsillar epithelium as part of the oropharynx is still easily identified. But then as you look at this, I think you will see a widely infiltrative tumor. No one is going to struggle with the infiltrative nature of this. Um, I think though, when you go up to higher power, you will notice that there is a very well-developed area of um, squamous differentiation, in fact, even some areas of keratinization. And then as you look on higher power, I think you will notice that there are several areas that suggest that maybe there is um, glandular type differentiation with these open spaces. And you'll have to say, well, you know, is that actually glandular differentiation or is it just a uh, part of a, a degenerative phenomenon? And this is of course the question that you have with these type of tumors. So as you know, with the oropharyngeal carcinoma category, it was not included at all in the 2005, then it was added in the 17 edition, and now we've decreased the number of entities to just um, hamartomatous polyps, and then HPV-associated versus HPV-independent. Now with the HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma, recognize that the neuroendocrine carcinoma category can also be seen, but is not necessarily what I'm going to discuss here at this moment. I think importantly for squamous cell carcinoma, there are three types that don't go through a dysplastic precursor. So basaloid squamous, non-keratinizing squamous, which is what I'm going to discuss here, and lymphoepithelial carcinomas are the ones that don't really have any um, surface epithelial involvement. But what I'd like to highlight just for a moment is in oropharyngeal lesions, when I look at this space, I don't see a junction with the underlying uh, stromal compartment. There's no basement membrane. I'll look at this on higher power. So this is why the concept of a in situ lesion in the oropharynx is complete uh, farce, because they are all invasive by definition once they develop as a carcinoma. And so I think you will notice in this example, that is the area of the carcinoma right there, incredibly small. It was only two millimeters and yet still presenting with an area of um, the patient having uh, metastatic disease. So when you think about it, they are usually below the surface epithelium. They have a very strong P16 as a uh, surrogate marker for HPV associated findings. Base of tongue lesion, again, being strongly immunoreactive with P16. There is also a very nice reporting guide for this, as you know, and you can certainly go and use it from the ICCR as well. So this is actually the example of what I drove before. It's an adenosquamous carcinoma. So it is important in these lesions to try and separate out the various subtypes within the HPV-associated carcinoma category. Um, and in these instances, there is mucinous differentiation, but if you don't do a mucicarmine type stain or perhaps a CEA or other marker of mucinous differentiation, you won't be able to identify it. They also have ciliated uh, oropharyngeal uh, adenosquamous carcinomas. So just because you see cilia does not put it into the benign category. And in fact, all of those are neoplastic cells that are also positive with um, P16. Sometimes the mucinous differentiation is not so easy to identify, but I think you can tell that there are vacuoles in every uh, in several of these neoplastic cells as well. And then, of course, when you do a mucicarmine, you'll be able to highlight intracytoplasmic mucin in several of them to be able to get to adenosquamous carcinoma. That should be separated from acantholytic squamous cell carcinoma. This is a type where you have very, very well differentiated uh, squamous uh, epithelium with nice intercellular borders, but because it is dilapidated, you'll have these areas of central dilapidation um, as an acantholytic appearance, very similar to acantholytic squamous cell carcinoma that you see in the skin.
And then importantly, necrotizing salar metaplasia also needs to be excluded because it's going to be squamous epithelium following down the natural uh, gland duct uh, luminal spaces of a necrotized um, minor mucoceros gland. So in this case, you can see the minor mucoceros gland immediately adjacent and then this very lobular architecture where the squamous epithelium has grown down into it and is re-epitheliizing that particular space as a reactive phenomenon. Sometimes it can be remarkably profound though, you know, here on high power, there's even dyskeratotic cells and of course there's mucinous epithelium because you're filling in to a gland duct space. So it's always important in these entities to look at them and take into consideration the underlying pattern that you see for the overall lesion. And of course, it, at the end point, just profound uh, squamous metaplasia is all that is going to remain. Okay, let's finish up now with case number 10, presented with a neck mass and imaging demonstrated two masses in this particular patient. And again, I thought it would be nice just to end on a case that is um, really quite small. This is what we usually get in the head and neck, just these core needle biopsy type specimens. Um, what I usually try and identify is, is there any residual lesional tissue that I can recognize? And in this case, I don't see any lymph node. I don't see any salivary gland. I don't see any thyroid. I don't see anything else that I recognize. It all just seems to be lesional tissue. And so then I go up to, you know, a higher power and begin to drive and say, well, what do I see? Well, you know, there's kind of a nested architecture to this. There's a very rich vascularity in the background. But I do think that there's a very well-developed, um, you know, kind of packeted appearance to these. And um, I'm going to think about several lesions within the uh, neuroendocrine tumor category for this particular case as well. And let's go and highlight what one should think about when you think about these lesions. Well, the first thing you do need to think about is extraskeletal myxoid chondrosoc. That is one of the tumors that can develop within the upper aero digestive tract in this kind of reticulated appearance, recognizing that the NR4A3 fusion either with EWSR1 or TAF15 can certainly be seen. But it's a very difficult tumor to reach a definitive diagnosis on because it has multiple different patterns of growth, multiple different areas in the background. And of course, the immunophenotype is not really that um, specific because it can be S100, CD117, synapto NSE, sometimes even INI1 loss um, without any evidence of muscle differentiation. So here is an example. I think lots and lots of myxoid background. If you go back to what I just showed with the myoepithelial tumors, I think you would think, oh, that's quite similar. Another example here with a very, very uh, thick fibrous band separating between it. On high power, I think, oh, goodness, you would think that this is probably part of a pleomorphic adenoma as well. So a very um, difficult tumor category with this uh, component of the neoplastic cells set within a myxoid background. Uh, matrix type material. But of course, the EWSR1 should help you in reaching that particular interpretation. I do want to introduce the GLE-1 altered soft tissue tumor category because that's another le lesion that was incorporated into this new book associated with either fusions or amplifications or even co-expressions of neighboring genes. But about 40% of these GLE-1 altered lesions develop within the oropharynx. And so it is something that you may see if they're doing a biopsy um, of the neck. Lots of lymphovascular invasion is usually seen. Wide spectrum of architectural and cytologic features arranged in nests and sheets, cords, pseudo rosettes, small cells, epithelioid in quality, high and rich vascularity associated with it. And of course, the immunophenotype, again, is going to have some smooth muscle actin and S100, CD10, but then usually it's negative, but that doesn't mean that it always is. And sometimes we'll have co-expression of CDK4, MDM2, and even STAT6. So here's an example of vascular protrusion, another example where it's inside the vessels. You can tell that it is arranged in kind of this nested architectural appearance with um, mitotic figures sometimes identified. Uh, this is kind of in a, almost a paraganglioma-like pattern or nested type architectural pattern. So that's why it's included in the differential in this case. And here again, these areas of separation with a fibro, uh, fibromyxoid background. So amplification or uh, rearrangement can be seen with GLE-1 and just recognize again that this is a newly defined entity by yeah. its molecular alterations. And so it will be almost impossible to get the diagnosis without uh, reaching that area. So this particular diagnosis of the lesion I drove is actually a paraganglioma. So uh, I'm just highlighting it because it is one of the tumors that has been, you know, separated out and now incorporated into the whole neuroendocrine type tumor category. Again, 
the imaging studies for these are quite helpful and recognize that neuroendocrine markers, GATA, tyrosine hydroxylase, SSTR2A, et cetera, can be seen with um, imaging studies helping to identify them. Quite frequently, the imaging studies will also be able to uh, inject it so that you get pre-surgical embolization of these lesions. And so quite frequently, if I see embolic material in the background, I will know that they have at least tried to decrease the amount of uh, bleeding. I think you can tell the Zellbollen architecture here. This is from our case to highlight, again, that Zellbollen type architecture in a fibrovascular uh, background stroma. Very characteristic here with the uh, sustentacular supporting framework immediately adjacent that is highlighted with either an S100, SOX10, or GFAP. Sometimes it is lost and decreased um, when you have those that transition to malignancy. Tyrosine hydroxylase is also present in the cells, as are a number of neuroendocrine markers, but I think that the SSTR2A that has been introduced recently um, is helpful because it's also something that can be detected radiographically and then also be targeted therapeutically, and so it has multiple different reasons to be of value. And again, recognize that uh, paraganglioma will be positive with GATA3. I know that sometimes people are thinking about salivary gland tumors, and they may have used a GATA and therefore be a little bit confused by that. By definition, many of these are also syndrome associated with the SDH syndrome complex being the most frequently seen within the paraganglioma category or pheochromocytoma group as a whole, and therefore doing SDHB testing and identifying loss at least helps you to confirm the associated finding of a syndrome in those patients. So in conclusion, Lots of new entities have been introduced, um, but we are getting to a much, much smaller NOS group. So perhaps the NOS is now extinct. Remember to uh, always have a panel approach to your lesions in the upper aerodigestive tract, especially when they have um, a small blue round cell or spindle cell morphology, because otherwise you will uh, miss the diagnosis altogether. And especially some of those that have been recently introduced by their molecular definitions. So thank you very much. Sorry, I went over a few moments and I'm happy to take any questions at least for a few uh, minutes now. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for that spectacular, like it, it was just 10 cases, but like the amount of information that you were able to give through those 10 cases is, is almost like an encyclopedia. <laughs> 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 but thank you very much. Uh, there was just one question in the chat and because of the lack of time, we'll just take that one question. But if anybody else has any other questions, you could send an email to to uh, to Abby at DP, and we will forward those questions to Dr. Thompson and try to answer them back to you. So the one question that we had was, uh, where did that question go? Uh, I think if I can read it, it's uh, neuroendocrine markers being positive in TFCP2 rearranged rhabdos. And yes, unfortunately, they can. Not usually INSM1, but you can have co-expression with chrom uh, chromogranin A and synaptophysin. So uh, it's a relatively new tumor category group, however. And so to specifically say you can or cannot get them is probably a bit premature. Until we have more of these lesions um, outlined, um, it may not necessarily be something that you can rely on at this point. Thank you very much. Up there. So if there are any more questions, you can send them as an email to Abby or to me, uh, and we'll try to forward them to Dr. Thompson and uh, like respond back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. Uh, Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Take care.